This is Wisdom Anime Recap. This means war. Fujiko Mine visited Havana, where she posed as a reporter covering the Cuban Missile Crisis, a time when Fidel Castro had allowed the Soviet Union to store nuclear missiles on Cuban soil during the peak of the Cold War. It was clear that Castro knew Fujiko's identity from the start, yet he still kept her close. Goman Ishikawa also visited Cuba to meet with an American agent who aimed to employ him in an assassination plot against Castro, yet Goman refused. He noticed a picture of Fujiko, standing with Castro on the front page of a newspaper on the agent's desk. The agent explained she had gotten closer to him than the government had originally expected. Then, Fujiko emerged from the shadows and approached Goman to persuade him to join her in the assassination plot. Two weeks later, Castro boarded a plane to the United Nations building in America, joined by Fujiko for an in-flight interview. He assured her that his revolution was driven by a genuine interest in his country's well-being rather than personal gain. She'd asked him similar questions two months earlier when she'd inquired if he knew that the rumored oil fields and Soviet nuclear missiles within Cuba were the only things that made the outside world pay his revolution any mind, not to mention that the Soviets had only allied themselves with him in order to spite America. Of course, Castro knew. He confided that he too planned to use the Soviets as a stepping stone to spread communism around the globe. She asked him if his drive to spread his ideology stemmed from a vulgar desire to simply shake the world. Why did she choose to stay by his side if she believed this about him, he wondered. Could it be that she believed the opposite? A group of armed men hijacked the plane mid-interview. They were supporters of the old Cuban government, aiming to overthrow Castro. They demanded the location of the rumored oil fields, but Castro told them they didn't exist. The hijackers used the plane's communications equipment to contact the Americans. They demanded asylum until the old Cuban government was restored, which was only possible in a communist state, as they would value Castro's life, meaning they could continue using his kidnapping as leverage. The news reached the White House, where President John F. Kennedy gave the order to send out an aircraft to refuel Castro's plane in the air, accompanied by three fighter jets tasked with shooting him down. A surprise Soviet plane joined them to stop the American pilots from following through under threat of nuclear war for interfering with an allied communist country. As the hijackers' attention deviated to the horde of aircrafts outside, Fujiko fished for Castro's cigar cutter in his pocket to cut the ropes that bound their hands. She asked him if the oil fields truly didn't exist. This was the reason for his meeting with the United Nations. Once the world knew that they did not exist, they would leave Cuba alone after the Cold War ended. The Soviets unleashed a preemptive shot, missiles aimed toward the American jets, which would lead to a full-scale nuclear war, as a dogfight here would inevitably escalate. Yet the third American plane emerged from the clouds with Goman standing on its wings. He flew between the missiles, close enough to slice them in half, single-handedly stopping the worst-case scenario, World War III. As Fujiko and Castro made their way to the rear door of the plane, they came upon one of the hijackers. He declared his desire to go down in history, making it clear that he and his Confederates' actions were driven by a base desire for personal gain as they leapt onto Goman's plane and flew away. Castro arrived safely at the United Nations building in New York to announce that the hidden oil fields never existed. Fujiko listened to his speech over the radio at a beach back in Cuba. Goman inquired as to why she had chosen not to follow through on the assassination, although he believed she'd done the right thing, as her actions helped prevent further violence in Cuba after the end of the Cold War. She confided that Castro had lied about the hidden oil fields to the UN. They truly did exist. Her original purpose in coming to Cuba was to learn their location, which happened to be on this beach. Goman asked why she had chosen to keep this information secret rather than selling it off. Did she truly value the well-being of Cuba more than her own greed, or had she fallen in love with Castro? Fujiko gave him an intentionally contradictory answer before leaving, further eluding his understanding of this woman who fascinated him. Good God, that's some spicy fucking salsa. <laughs> Fujiko went on to infiltrate an all-girls school as a teacher. She entranced the students in class as they fawned over her recitation of Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's Apprentice. She read a passage on women's innate humility who choose to decorate themselves with pleasing clothes and beauty products, unlike men who are so arrogant as to believe themselves presentable as God made them. One girl admired her with particular fervor, a girl with dark hair. She sat in the school garden after class, penning a passionate love letter for Miss Fujiko when she noticed her in the distance having a discussion with one of the other girls. 
She confessed her love to her in blunt terms, yet Fujiko assured her that this feeling was an illusion, a girlish lust magnified by her immaturity. Then, in a fit of passion, the girl leaned over and kissed her. Fujiko chose to indulge her, pulling the girl close and matching her energy. The dark-haired girl still watched from afar as the other girl fled, overwhelmed by her excitement, and her eyes met with Fujiko's. She approached her to confront her for spying, yet the dark-haired girl could only cry in response. Fujiko offered a warm apology, wiping the tears from her eyes and complimenting her beauty. The dark-haired girl shared her name with Fujiko, Isolde. They wandered the school premises together for the rest of the day, scrambling Isolde's ability to sort out her feelings. Fujiko asked about the pendant on her necklace. She confided that it was a gift from her late father, who'd been a renowned scholar in life before passing a month prior. The other girls watched them both from afar, their hearts brimming with jealousy over the special interest Fujiko had taken in Isolde. They confronted her when she and Fujiko split, dragging her to the school's chapel to butcher her long black hair and uniform. Isolde visited Fujiko's lodgings on the school grounds, seeking both love and comfort from her. Fujiko indulged her, pulling her in and holding her close, planting gentle kisses upon her neck. She recited Goethe's passage on the humility of women once more. Yet Isolde's voice sounded different, tinged with a baritone, as she questioned whether Fujiko was as humble as the pros expected her to be. She brought her knee against Fujiko's stomach, knocking her to the ground. As the stranger removed his wig, Fujiko realized it was Oscar who stood before her, Zenigata's right-hand man. He'd been undercover from the start to stop her stealing Isolde's pendant, which contained a priceless thesis penned by her late father. Truth be told, Zenigata's true impetus to pursue the case lay with Lupin's calling card, which signaled his appearance and another opportunity to catch him. Oscar tied Fujiko to the bed. He brooded on his resentment for her possessing Zenigata during the fiasco with Ayan Meyer, while he refused to pay him any mind. He would use Fujiko to lure Lupin into capture, so that Zenigata might finally see him as he saw her. And when Fujiko awoke the next day, she saw a dark figure looming at her window. Oscar wandered the premises, still undercover as Isolde, until he came upon Lupin, who brought him to the chapel. They were confronted by the schoolgirls, who emerged from the chancel wielding semi-automatic weapons and chased Lupin to the school's greenhouse. Oscar locked him inside and activated the pesticide spray. This act finally earned him the girls' respect, who were still unaware that he was undercover, so they begged his forgiveness until he brushed them off. He received a call from Zenigata on his walkie-talkie, but something was wrong. He could hear Zenigata's cries of pain, as well as Fujiko Mine's calm voice on the other side. She explained she had swapped the pendant from around his neck the night before with a fake. She knew about its elaborate locking mechanism, which would destroy its contents unless she input the correct code. This was a needlessly complex ruse for a girl's gift from her father, so she knew Oscar had contrived the pendant himself. He heard Zenigata's cries once more, so he folded and gave Fujiko the code. When he saw Zenigata once more, his eyes lit up as he ran to him, but Zenigata was oblivious to what had happened. Fujiko had tricked him. She stayed at a nearby hotel with Lupin for the night, where she split the reward of her plunder as thanks for untying her. Lupin asked how she had managed to trick Oscar, so she explained she had simply replayed a recording she'd made during her unorthodox lovemaking session with Zenigata over the walkie-talkie. 